You know, uh, one of the things that has influenced all of us who came up through the public school system in the last 30, 40 years is uh, what we were told was uh, radiocarbon dating. Have I got mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's uh, <laughs> a, a new thing called uh, radiometric. Well, radiocarbon dating is a form of radiometric It is a form of radiometric aging. Um, you argue that uh, radiocarbon dating uh, does not necessarily uh, witness to millions or billions of years, that uh, it often witnesses to a much younger time frame. Can you, can you expand on that for us? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, radiocarbon dating um, is used to date, ostensibly date, um, samples of organic origin, so when they're alive, plants, animals, whatever, are absorbing carbon dioxide. The plants are absorbing carbon dioxide, and the animals are eating the plants and absorbing the, the material from the plants. So they are building themselves out of uh, the carbon in the atmosphere, which includes some carbon-14. Right? And so they're continually exchanging all of their carbon in, the, in their bodies with this atmospheric carbon dioxide. So they have carbon, carbon in their bodies, radioactive carbon, carbon-14 in their bodies at the same level as in the, is in the atmosphere. But when they die, they stop doing that. And the carbon-14 that's in their bodies starts to decay away. And so theoretically, if you can measure at any given point in time the ratio of carbon-14 that's in the body to the normal carbon-12, which is not radioactive, that's in the body and therefore doesn't change, you can, on the basis of that ratio, you can do a calculation that says when that decay started. In other words, when the whatever it is that was living died and, and started to, to go through this process. Now, the interesting thing of all of this is that coal, which is carbon, and which is found in pretty much all of the geolo strata in the geological column, um, is allegedly millions, tens of millions to hundreds of millions of years old. And some creation scientists gathered some coal samples from around the U.S. from different seams which spanned a range range from about 35 million to 320 million or something like that. They sent these to a radiocarbon dating lab and the answers came back at a value that's about a hundred, over a hundred times the sensitivity of the instrument so it's not a measurement error and they indicated range of ages in the range of 50,000 years, whereas the coal, according to geological timescales, is supposedly tens to hundreds of millions of years old. And a similar thing was done with diamonds, which were supposedly even older, like billions of years old. Um, so the, the carbon in there is indicating, in fact, the, di the diamonds, the radiometric gauge for the diamonds came out to be essentially the same as that for the coal. 50,000. Yeah. I know, give or take yeah. some. There's some error, measurement error in this. Um, and the, so they're, but they're definitely much, much younger than would be ascribed by the standard evolutionary age. Now they're still older yeah, than still, the biblical age, right, right? Right. But if you think about this, it depends on the starting ratio of carbon 14 to carbon 12 at the time the plant dies, the plant that formed the coal mm. dies. And so if you think of all of the carbon that's buried in the ground as coal and oil and natural gas, there was a tremendous amount of carbon in the biosphere before the flood. So all of these deposits were buried during the flood, right? Mm -hmm. So that would change the starting ratio of the carbon-14 to carbon-12 at the time the plants were buried, the time that it's, the carbon-14 started to decay. But the measurements are taken on the assumption that the starting ratio was the same as it is today, but it was much smaller. And in fact, if, you, if there was as much as 245 times the amount of carbon present today that was in the biosphere then, then the age you would calculate would actually be 4,500 years. You mentioned in, in the article that I'm referring to that um, some radiocarbon dating was done on um, the um, detritus that fell out of Mount St. Helens and it aged it at 2.6 million years? 
Well, that's actually another kind of um, that's radiometric. Radiometric. Dating. Yeah, the radiocarbon dating, uh, given the sensitivity of today's instruments, cannot theoretically determine an age any greater than about 90,000 years. Uh, but there are other decay chains like uranium to lead and uh, uh, potassium to argon and rubidium to strontium that have what's called much longer half-lives, so they can be used to measure much longer times. Now, with what you said about radiocarbon dating, um, why is it still put out as a standard? You know, why is it still sort of the ultimate proof of the age of uh, rock strata and, and, and things generally in the, in the world? Um, well, it's, it's used a lot to measure, uh, you know, kind of recent past uh, organic materials that you might dig up from an archaeological site. Mm -hmm. And it, given that the, the information is post-flood, given that the, the sample comes from a post-flood, it does a pretty good job. Although it's recognized that the production rate of carbon-14 in the past was different than it is now, so they actually have calibration curves. So they've taken things that they've measured and for which they can independently assess the, or determine the age and found out there's a difference, so they have a calibration curve for carbon-14. Do, do, uh, but, for, but for really old ages, it doesn't work at all. Okay, now, the general scientific community out there who have a materialistic worldview and see things, uh, you know, in terms of evolution, uh, do they admit uh, or acknowledge that if, in fact, there was a universe, universal flood, that uh, all the rules change? I don't know. Um, I would highly doubt it, right? I mean, that paradigm of evolutionary ages is just so firmly entrenched in the scientific community, I don't even think they consider the potential of a global flood. I believe geologists, you know, from uh, hearing some of the other presenters, that geologists are being, becoming more attuned to the fact that many of the Earth's geological features are the result of catastrophic floods of one shape or another. Um, there's a thing referred to as the Missoula flood, which is thought to, Lake Missoula flood, which is thought to have formed some of the features in northwestern U.S. And um, Lake Agassiz flood, which is thought to have formed much of the Niagara escarpment and that sort of thing. But they haven't yet kind of made the shift to a global flood. You know, these are all kind of local floods. Right. So I think in, in the geological community, they're beginning to back off the perspective that everything was formed by uniformitarian processes, that there were catastrophic processes involved. And that's, it'll take a while for that to change the whole paradigm. Uh, just uh, about a minute and a half left, Jim. Um, uh, in terms of um, your family, uh, what do they think about um, your involvement with uh, CMI? Uh, they're very supportive. Yeah. They really are. Yeah. They, well, for one thing, they act as guinea pigs for my presentations. Oh, and they? Tell me, tell, tell me I, they need fixing. Right. Uh, but they were all here for my presentation the other day, so yeah. uh, they're very, very supportive. So they're walking uh, this journey with you. They are. Um, are you comfortable with where you are now? Like, as, as uh, 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 someone who's committed his life to the Lord, uh, you, you, you have a high view of Scripture, uh, you've got a huge history as a nuclear physicist, and now you're making presentations for the credibility of the scripture. I mean... Uh, I am very comfortable. This is in, like a whole in, new life for you. In fact, I feel now that I am finally doing something that's useful mm -hmm. and important. And looking back, it's almost like, well, more than almost like, my whole life was training and preparation for this. Preparation. My scientific education, my job, uh, as part of my job, uh, to particularly towards the end, I had to create and give presentations to people on technical matters who may not have been as technical. Uh, right. So uh, it's just all been preparation for that. Well, it's been a fascinating uh, 20 minutes. Dr. Jim Mason, thanks for coming our way. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.